Okay, Salaamu Alaikum everybody. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to another amazing uh, session with the Book of Illuminations. Um, this is the last halakha of Ramadan, which is incredible. I'm sure everybody is wondering how Ramadan passed this quickly. Um, you know, it's a bittersweet moment, obviously, because Ramadan is so beautiful and spiritual, but it's happening in the midst of this genocide and the darkness in the world. Um, but I'm always so grateful anytime we can gather in these spaces and that this education can continue. Um, because I think this is our way to resist and push back and continue, you know, on this journey of, of knowledge and empowerment. Um, on that note, I actually want to start with sharing some really, um, I think, exciting news. Save the date. Um, I wanted to announce um, that we are working towards planning our first Usuli annual conference. And we are going to um, be targeting uh, October 11th and 12th, which is a Friday and a Saturday. So please save that date. Um, we will obviously share more details as they come, but it's exciting because um, what will anchor the event is some really good, you know, conversations, um, keynote speech with Sheikh, um, hopefully some panels with really smart people about um, some of the topics that I think a lot of us are, you know, grappling with in, in the way that the world is now. Um, so we'll have like um, some formal, um, you know, panels and speakers and whatnot, and um, probably like a fundraising dinner, and then maybe some casual events before and after. So it'll be a really nice opportunity um, for people, you know, to meet in person. Um, you know, I think especially after the pandemic, um, you know, these kinds of gatherings are, are very special. Um, and I know a lot of people from around the world have, you know, asked us to nail down those dates so they can start planning. Um, and it's a nice way to just, you know, also meet with other people who follow what we do here. I've gotten lots of requests from people, you know, asking how can I meet people in my geographic location who also follow Usuli. Um, I hope that if you guys can, can come and meet us in person, that would be terrific. So again, save October 11th and 12th of this year. Um, I also <coughs> have to highlight, um, you know, yesterday's um, or Friday's uh, incredible khutbah, as always. Um, it's titled, How to Fix an Umma, Hurriya, Freedom, and Izza, Dignity. And obviously, freedom and dignity are, you know, these two, on, you know, very um, foundational themes that we discussed a lot in our Project Illumin Tafsir journey. Um, and, you know, they are... Um, you know, really the key to, I think, turning things around. And every week, Sheikh in his khutbahs, in his halakas, has shared, you know, examples of how the Muslim world has really lost um, their ability to operate, you know, in a beautiful way, in, in like a civilization building way, as in our history, um, because of the loss of freedom and dignity. And, um, he continues to hammer home this idea that, you know, if you don't understand your history and how you arrived at where, where you are today, then you have no chance of fixing it. And I thought that it was extremely powerful. I just want to share a few examples that really moved me as I was listening to the khutbah and then also the halakha from last week because I was not here physically in attendance. And when I re-listened to it, I just thought there were these incredible pearls that, you know, really connected around these ideas of freedom and dignity. Um, but clearly, um, we understood from um, our own history, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, really empowered his own companions. Um, that it was an example of you know, taking the individual and finding out what is their gift, what is you know, their, their, what's special about them, and empowering them and unleashing them. And that's oftentimes what we really try to teach here is you know, learning what your gift is and how you can you know, be creative or be um, empowered to do what you were put on this earth to do. Because um, as we know, as things are today, oftentimes Muslims, um, you know, kids might have, um, might be pushed towards careers in, you know, being, becoming doctors or engineers or, you know, something and suppressing, you know, maybe creative talent that, that could be um, developed into something really powerful and beautiful. Um, and that um, even the idea that uh, the Prophet Muhammad was, you know, peace be upon him, was surrounded by, obviously, hypocrites. And there were so many stories about what the hypocrites would do, but he was not allowed to, you know, or didn't punish them or silence them or oppress them or, um, you know, try to respond in a way that we might see in our age today. Um, and the reason is because we understand, as Sheikh shared with us, that this, that, that authoritarian or despotic dynamic would take down an entire civilization, and we are living that now. Um, and the idea that, you know, even there's another example that Sheikh gave that I thought was really powerful, 
um, is that all of the great minds in our world today are attracted to the US or Western countries because of freedom and that this is a sunnah of, of God that you know, obviously we see our best minds, our scientists from around the world might, you know, want to migrate to, to the US where they have the freedom to develop and you know, whatever. They are not attracted to China or Russia or oppressive countries. And there's obviously something very important to that is that as human beings, we want that freedom and that dignity. And then the really powerful example also that I was struck by from the Halakha last week um, of Napoleon's army. Um, Sheikh spent a lot of time talking about that history but how it was really fascinating when he said he's always been very um, intrigued by how armies act, like the individual soldiers act when their command is not there. Do they stop acting independently because they now have no one giving them orders or do they still have sort of some of the freedom of thought and the dignity to say no, even if our commander is not here and giving us specific orders, we're gonna fight, we're gonna go, we're gonna do what we need to do. And this is such an interesting um, example, but it arises from this idea of, again, independent thought and being empowered. Um, you know, and so when I think also, um, I put that together with some of the messages that I get on the side from, you know, people who reach out to Suli, um, who follow our work, you know, whether from all different countries. And, you know, they tell us about situations personally in which they are, you know, either oppressed by, you know, a spouse, by a parent, um, by their society at large. Um, it is so heartbreaking because these are Muslim countries. You know, I have um, someone who wrote to me saying that her family expects her to marry someone without having ever met that person and how, you know, how odd that is. Um, you know, and then even the story that Sheikh shared about when uh, we were visiting um, a space that was a daycare and, you know, he saw this, these little post-it notes um, that were intended to be messages to the children, you know, you're wonderful, you're great, you're, you know, this and that. Um, just the dis difference, I mean, the, the, the power of, you know, um, the seeds that we, that we plant in our children, you know, um, that idea of, of really empowering um, kids to be who they are, you know, what is authentic to them, um, what, what really drives them. And so, you know, we're all talking now about how do we fix our ummah? How do we think, look to the future? How do we make things better? You know, we can't obviously do very much in, on the world stage in terms of, you know, what's happening with countries, but we can do a lot when it comes to what happens in our homes and, you know, with our relationships, with our children, teaching them um, the beauty of, you know, of dignity and freedom and really, um, you know, allowing them to, to flower with whatever gifts God gave them, um, not pushing them to be something that's counter to um, what they might feel intuitively is, is really empowering for them. So um, I just, I wanted to just share some of those beautiful examples and encourage people if you didn't have a chance, you know, to watch the khutbah or the halakha. There are just so many gems that, you know, that, that um, alhamdulillah, we share in the space that Sheikh shares with us. Um, and I really feel like that's just the key to how we're gonna be able to turn things around and create a, beauter, a be more beautiful future for us as Muslims. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm so excited again to engage in another journey uh, with the Book of Illuminations. And um, thank you and an early Eid uh, Mubarak to everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallah al-Ali al-Azim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik. على النبي الأمين المرسى الرحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تواب إحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحد الوحدة من لسان يفقه قولي We we finished sixty one right we are at 62? 62 or 63? Oh, we, yeah, I think, yeah, you are. Yeah, 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 we, we, the, the one uh, about freedom and the issue of Hurriya. That's 62. Uh, by, by this uh, number. أنت حر مما أنت عنه آيس. That's one.
Let me just make sure that. Yeah, the, the whole discourse on, on enslavement and uh, the context of what we said about Hurriya or freedom. Yeah, I think we can move on. All right, so sixty-three or من لم يقبل على الله بملاطفات الإحسان قيد إليه بسلاسل الامتحان. So the translation. Whoever is not thankful for graces runs the risk of losing them. And whoever is thankful fetters them with their own cords. It, it's interesting. Well, what a more literal translation. Um, would go something like this. Whoever is not drawn towards God through acts of grace, runs the risk of becoming fettered to God through difficult tests. It, this is um, the, the, the core idea is that as in, we find in numerous hadiths and as the especially in the Hadith tradition, that it is a part of Allah's justice and it is a part of Allah's rahmah that Allah wants to draw, wants to give human beings a fair chance to be drawn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah affirmatively desires huda or desires guidance for people. And that Allah affirmatively desires what is good for human beings, not what hurts them. Now, as we know that if Allah is uh, gives up on a human being, Allah no longer tests this human being. In other words, if you, if Allah allows you to just uh, enjoy everything in dunya, in an earthly life, uh, and everything is going your way, it is actually not a sign that Allah is pleased with you. It could be a sign of quite the opposite, that Allah has given up on you. And so Allah has given you everything you want on this earthly life uh, because there is no further hope vested into you. And so and that hardship or imtihans, these, these tests, 
that Allah sent our way are quite often an opportunity for Allah to draw you close. God, Allah is giving you an opportunity to, as, to, to come running to the divine for, doorstep um, because of the hardship that befalls you. That in fact, these imtihanat or these tests are often a sign that God is giving you an opportunity to draw closer. So what this aphorism basically says is that there is quite often Allah first attempts to draw a human being through acts of grace. Mulatafat al Ihsan is a, is a, such a, a wonderful expression because Mulatafa could literally mean um, uh, to. It's not quite flirting, but Mulatafa is when you are approached by acts of kindness and love. So Allah first approaches human beings with acts of kindness and love. And that is quite often the case. Now, if you are mindful of the acts of kindness and love, and you respond to these acts of kindness and love with gratitude, the divine objective of drawing you close to your maker is achieved. But as often happens, we take kindness and love for granted. And we take Allah's noun for granted. And whatever Allah gives us, we take for granted. And then there you run the risk that since acts of kindness and love have not drawn you closer to your Lord because you responded with ingratitude and when you take things for granted, it's a form of arrogance, entitlement. Then you run the risk that God switches the method from acts and kindness of grace to difficult tests that basically remind you of your need for your Lord. And I mean, each of you, you can reflect upon your own life because, I mean, definitely reflecting upon my own life, um, this is, I see so much truth to this. Um, God bestows a lot of gifts and um, truly acts of grace upon you. And when you continue to, as you, 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 you take things for granted, what eventually follows is a test and a very difficult test. And the test reminds you of how much you've taken for granted. And a smart person doesn't keep repeating that cycle as so many humans, as actually the majority of human beings, the majority of believers. Now, eventually, the, the biggest, we don't have it in this aphorism, but it, he says it later, the, 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 what's even worse than uh, running the risk 
that God tests you. What even is worse is when God no longer tests you because simply God has given up on you and things are just going your way constantly in this earthly life. And that's not a sign that God is pleased with you. That's actually quite often a sign that God is not pleased with you when uh, there, there are no longer difficult tests in your life. Let me see if I forgot anything. Yeah. There's a um, hadith that in Allah yabtali nasa bil khayr fa in lam ya'udu lillahi ibtalahum bil dara that um, Allah tests human beings with acts of grace, with khayr, with goodness, with giving them good things. And if they become, if they take it for granted, then Allah then tests them with hardship. Um, in this context, one of the, it's, it's not an aphorism, but it, it could have very well been an aphorism because it's so often repeated in when we talk about um, aphorism 63, that There is a word, matiya. Matiya means amount. And your, your, your attitude towards dunya, towards earthly life, either you will mount dunya, either earthly life will become your mount or earthly life will mount you or dunya will mount you. Either your passage through earthly life, you go through earthly life, the one in control, because you've understood what earthly life is about and that it is a transitory passage, a testing grounds. And so dunya never gains a foothold in your heart and your soul. You understand that you are in it because of God's unadulterated will. You are in it because God willed that you are in it. You are conscious because will God that you are conscious. What you have in it, the tools that you have in it, you have these tools because will that you have these tools. And that every blessing is a trust for an objective that because of this fundamental dynamic with your maker, none of the tools that you have, you have as a matter of, of entitlement. And none of the tools that any other human being has, has as a matter of entitlement. You, like everyone else, is being trusted and tested by what you have been given. And what rights you have in earthly life come from your Lord. And what obligations you have come from your Lord. So you approach earthly life like you approach homework. Something that you are charged to achieve objectives in. But it, it never dominates you because it never invades your heart and soul. 
you never get to that point where you are deluded into thinking that it is all about this life. If so, you've mounted, as they say, a dunya matiyatil mu'min. For a believer, for a true believer, a true Muslim, earthly life is but a mount for the true believer. The believer is anchored in earthly life because of God's will, but the believer is always in control. The believer never loses control, is never, put differently, at dunya matiyatul mu'min, a believer dominates earthly life, but is never dominated by earthly life. Now, if a believer fails to do this, the, as the, the saying goes, that Allah lam yaj'al al-mu'min matiyatan laha, that Allah never intended for dunya to dominate a believer. It is against Allah's will and intentions for you to become dunya's mount. In other words, for dunya to control you, for dunya to define your objectives, define your attitude, define your philosophy, define your moral anchor and your moral compass. Um, it's either your moral compass and your moral orientation is simply a reactive mode to your consciousness. In other words, you've experienced consciousness and you've experienced material things and your morality and your moral compass was shaped by the material things you experienced. And if so, then earthly life mounts you, it dominates you. Or your consciousness, your moral consciousness is formed from, is shaped by your relationship to your maker, not by the objective stimuli that you simply received from your material existence. It, it comes from in fact, your interaction with your maker, with your, the, 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 uh, that most sacred of relationships with your maker. And then you are achieving Allah's objective in, in dominating earthly life, not being dominated by earthly life. Um, Part of, uh, I mean, this is um, part of the of, of the important conversations that take place also when we talk about uh, sixty three. Um, is the I, we've we've exp we've encountered this before, but. It, it, it's, it's a, it, it, this conversation takes place from different nuances and different angles. And that is, those, I'll say it in Arabic first and then explain it. As opposed to that those who understand from their faith nothing but sharia, but the law, their relationship to dunya is superficial. And in fact, they will often, without realizing it, become dominated by dunya. Because they will think that discharging the law is sufficient for them to avoid 
being dominated by dunya. They will think that just because I pray five times a day, just because I fast Ramadan, just because I pay zakah, I've, I've achieved the objective. I'm successful. And just because I do my ibadat, just because I avoid major acts of haram, just because I don't drink or I don't uh, fornicate or I don't whatever, that I, I, I've... I successfully guarded my being from becoming dominated by dunya. And that, it, it, there's a long conversation about how law is often deceptive and a trick in that regard. Because all of these things are important, obviously, but they're not sufficient. If you wake up and you spend your entire day and then you go to bed and all your worries and all your thoughts are nothing more than reactive modes to the stimuli received by dunya, then in fact you've obtained from the laws nothing but kushur, nothing but surface superficiality. The truth of the tariqah, the tariqah means the way, the path. The very in intended purpose of the path, the reason that we have the law, is that the law aids you to achieve spiritual objectives. And the spiritual objectives come from your relationship to Allah. As in, in the, the, you know, whether you are, you, whether you term it awliya Allah or ashabillah, that I, I like the term ashabillah because I, I find that it resonates with me. That you befriend Allah, you befriend God. God is not just a theoretical construct, it's not some remote thing, but God is a constant companion in everything, in every minute, in every past. And God is a constant companion because you know that your very consciousness does not make any sense. The difference between your consciousness and the consciousness of a squirrel that you might find dead on the road or the consciousness of a insect that lives but few moments compared to your lifetime. You, all consciousness by its very essence is the same. So there's no difference between one consciousness and another. The only distinction philosophically comes from a higher power. And the higher power is your relationship to your maker. And it is that relationship to your maker that either edifies you, elevates you, makes you into something more than just an insect or an animal or whatever. Or if you let go of it, you debase yourself. And in fact, you become indistinguishable from any other conscious. And if you understand your, that meaning comes from your relationship to your maker, then you also understand that your relationship to all other things is derivative from your relationship to your maker. From that, so in other words, my relationship to my money is not, it doesn't have an essence or, an, or, or a core or, an, or a natural meaning. There is no natural meaning to your relationship to capital. The meaning comes from the meaning given to you by your maker. And when your maker says, for instance, that your money is a trust and you are, and I, I give you this wealth in order to test you, that's where that meaning comes from. That is defined by your maker. Okay, again, I mean, uh, 
um, this this is uh, uh, we'll encounter this in a bit later, but you know, a true relationship is it's like um, uh, some of the most famous lessons. I, I forgot who precisely, and maybe I'll, I'll encounter this in, in um, later on, or it will remind me. I forgot who said this. That uh, I spent twenty years developing my relationship with God, and twenty years understanding that relationship. It 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 done. It, it it's not achieved overnight. It's not something that, oh, I've heard it before. Why am I hearing it again? This is something that you continue deliberately working on, like all the relationships. I mean, imagine if any friendship, any companionship, imagine the amount of time and energy that you invest in understanding a person that you count as a companion. Then imagine what would be necessary to invest in the divine being. So I feel a little bit odd as I remind you of these principles and we just move on to the next aphorism because the way it's supposed to be done is that we we talk about it and then we retreat to work on it in deliberate exercises for weeks. And then we come back to talk about whether we're ready to move to the next aphorism. That's supposed the way it's supposed to be done. But it is If the most meaningful relationship in your existence is not your relationship with God, then I suggest to you, if the, again, if the most meaningful relationship in your existence is not your relationship with God, then I suggest to you, you need to review your standing and your status before the hereafter, before it is too late. You, you can't count on saying, well, you know, I have time. Who knows? And there are so many people that thought, I have time, I'll develop it later in life, but something happens in their psychology, in their spirit, where instead of becoming more receptive and open to God as the age, they actually become the opposite. Instead of becoming friendlier to God, more, more of a potential friend to God, it is as if God removes the baraka, takes away that grace, and they become grouchier and less receptive and less open to God. So, it is one of the most idiotic things that you experience constantly in life it is people who are waiting till they get older to start working on the relationship. And if I tell you the number of older people that I've seen, older meaning, you know, 60s and beyond, who in fact have become less able and less open and less receptive to God, and they themselves don't understand why. It's just that the spirit, something happens to the spirit where they, they, they find themselves only just unable to, to, to have the kind of thoughts that they used to have in their youth where we're definitely more receptive to the divine. So my, my point is, is that death is not the only calamity an equal and even worse calamity is thus your soul souring on God, your very spirit becoming closed off 
to the possibilities of the divine. So if the most important meaningful relationship in your existence is not Allah, you need to work on it now, not a year from now, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now. And that is often a serious sign that you need to invest in yourself and invest in your relationship with Allah. This is a point we're going to talk, inshallah, about the, the role of Adab. But, of course, Adab just means good manners. Um, and in, as we, as inshallah, we'll talk about, um, the, the essence of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it be elevates to what it should be, it is anchored, it is mostly adab. In, in other words, what there are people who are drawn to Allah or people who build their relationship to, to God on the basis of good moral character. Adab, how? Allah from the moment you are created gives you numerous bounties and numerous gifts. And if you are properly grateful, gratitude is part of Adab. And lack of gratitude is bad moral character, is qillat Adab. When you don't say thank you, we say you're rude. And so all those who don't say thank you in its core, in its essence, say it's rudeness. They are rude with their maker because God is constantly giving and they simply do not express gratitude. So they're rude people. And, and so it is not Adab that drew them to God or that created any type of relationship with their maker, it left to their own accord, they are actually rude people. Left to their own accord, they fail to express gratitude. So this brings up the second way, and this is the, what this aphorism is talking about, the second way that you are drawn to God. Instead of being drawn to God through adab, through good moral character, i.e. gratitude, and uh, all the other lofty moral principles, you are drawn to God because of hardship, that God tests you through difficult means, gives you disease, gives you a calamity, gives you a disaster, whatever it is. And then you remember God, and then you need God, and then you pray to God, and so on. And here your relationship was not built on shukr, on gratitude, or adab. Your relationship was built out of desperate need. It is, I can't emphasize or I can't express how, how strongly this is um, emphasized or this is underscored, that people of Arafan, people of um, uh, those who those who have a, a truly meaningful suhbah, those who have a truly meaningful relationship of companionship with their Lord, a, a, a relationship of friendliness with their Lord, those who are truly friends of the Lord, 
the essence of that relationship is built on adab and not on need. They came to God because they are people that valued having proper manners with God. And because of that, they are thankful people because they are ashab adab. They, they are people of good moral manners, good moral character. Those who come to God through the mechanisms of hardship and testing, um, their relationship to God always remains at the level of superficiality. It never, it's never deep. It's never meaningful. Um, and it, it doesn't become meaningful until they recognize that. Until they recognize, oh yes, I'm the type of person that as uh, Allah reminds us in the Quran numerous times, yeah, I'm the type of person who sort of forgets about God or, you know, has a hard time concentrating in prayer or starts getting bored with all this uh, religious stuff. And then when something really horrible happens, I, I, I'm pray with all my heart and I pray long hours and I, you know, beg God and I plead with God. And, yeah, when I think about my life, I've done this over and over, you know, then God doesn't test me anymore, then I sort of, like, forget about it, and, and so on. And it, because that relationship is not a relationship built on Adam. And God, and it is emphasized in the context of this and several other, of the other aphorisms, that 90% of Iman, of true Iman is Adab. It is built on that being a person of good, why do I have this relationship with my maker? It is because I am a person of Adab. Um, and if you don't have Adab, then you don't have real Iman. You, you have Islam. Yeah, you intellectually, but you but you're but you're a person who, who, who doesn't understand the need to be grateful or to express thanks or, in other words, you just don't have good manners. With, and not having good manners with God. And as we'll see in, in an aphorism that will come in a second, that um, good manners is indivisible. There is no such thing as someone who has good manners with human beings but bad manners with God. Or vice versa, someone who has good manners with God, but bad manners with human beings. That good manners is good manners. It, it's indivisible. We'll come to that in a second, inshallah. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so 63... Um, is in Islamic theology, you uh, the, you hear the expression a lot, shukr naam And shukr naam just means literally to be thankful or grateful for what you've been given. Naam is, is God's blessings or God's graces. And shukr means to be grateful or thankful. So this aphorism, مَنْ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ النِّعَمْ فَقَدْ تَعَرَّضَ لِزَوَالِهَا وَمَنْ شَكَرَهَا فَقَدْ قَيَّدَهَا بِعِقَالِهَا Whoever is not thankful for blessings runs the risk of losing them. And whoever is thankful, is grateful, uh, it, 
binds, I, I realize that I've read the wrong translation when I was reading the aphorism before it. That, that's why the translation seemed so off. But anyway, and so, uh, and whoever is thankful or grateful fetters them or ties them with their own cords. Um, if this has set layers of meaning, the first layer of meaning is that if you are properly thankful, then in fact, as Allah told us repeatedly in the Quran, that um, the chances are that God will continue allowing you to enjoy these graces and these blessings. Now, of course, um, that doesn't mean that gratitude is some type of immunity from being tested. But as Allah repeatedly tells you that even if you are tested, you will be tested by what you can handle. And that you will be, that Allah, in, in your companionship with Allah, you will appreciate and understand the test so that life doesn't dominate you and doesn't break you. Now, of course, there are calamities that befall all, but calamities are the exception. Allah saves us from numerous calamities, and calamities, especially the calamities that result from our own failure to achieve justice. These are like calamities like the Mongol invasion or uh, the, the, when the Crusades invaded uh, Palestine and massacred all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, or the calamities like what's happening in Gaza now. These calamities are the direct products of human injustice. Um, they're extremely hard tests, and they, they befall just, and the just and unjust. But these are exceptions because Allah saves us from our own follies numerous times, and for very long periods of times until our own follies catch up with us, and finally uh, inflict great harm and pain. But other than these exceptional circumstances, you know, when you're talking about exceptional circumstance of mass destruction and mass suffering, to continue enjoying or to have a, 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 the greatest opportunity of being in Allah's care, your greatest guarantee is al adab ma Allah, is to have proper manners, proper moral character with Allah. That Allah never degrades that who befriends Allah. And this, you, you, uh, I mean, you talk to any person who has developed a real relationship with God, and the first thing they'll tell you, Allah la yudayyani. And this, I, I mean, subhanAllah, I was watching, uh, even in, in the midst of the genocide, I was watching um, a school that's responding to genocide and hunger by the, the, this... Uh, group of female shiuch and male shiuch who are responding to the genocide and hunger by um, teaching the Quran and helping a, a group of children and women. The, 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 the um, documentary talked about most older students were women and children. 
memorize the Quran. But then I was, again, I was listening to the, the shiuch who established this, this school, and it struck me, the sheikh said, Allah lan yudayana. Allah, that is a very common expression you hear, that Allah will not allow me to be lost. And regardless of the hardships inflicted upon you in hayat dunya by earthly life, when your relationship with your Lord is solid, what strikes other human beings as extremely painful, as unbearable, becomes bearable and not so painful in your relationship with Allah. And that is why you find those who are truly pious always respond to you by speaking of Allah's blessings, not of Allah's tests. And you will find their trust in Allah for a person who doesn't have a relationship with Allah. You say, why are they so trusting Allah when they seem to have nothing compared to those who have all types of material things. And the response is, that's what the Sufis call the sir, the secret. That, that sweetness, that happiness, that, that absolute ecstasy that comes from your relationship with your Lord, that renders all material tests insignificant and small in comparison. Um, I realize I'm not going to finish the aphorisms today, but so this aphorism focuses on shukran nam. Now, as I said, maybe we should. Uh, okay, no, let's take the. Um, so, what is what is meant by shukr, by gratitude? Is it just that you sit and you do dhikr? Is that what gratitude is? Is it just that you discharge your, you, you do your prayers and, uh, you know, not, your mind is not drifting about earthly things as you do your prayers. So one of the most important lessons is um, the following. Um, and this is anchored when the, 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 uh, on the famous hadith that the Prophet والسلام, would pray, would continue praying, until his feet would be swollen. And on more than one occasion, this, this happens in, in different uh, contexts, uh, where the Prophet is, is asked, you know that Allah has forgiven all your sins, and you know that Allah has guaranteed you Jannah. There's no question about you, Muhammad, that you're going to Jannah. So why do you keep praying until your feet are swollen? And his consistent response to this is, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shouldn't I be a grateful human being? Now, عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shakur to be a person Shakur is, is a person who consistently is consistently and invariably grateful. And to be a, a Shakur, to be a person who's grateful about things that you ought to be grateful for, for are a part of good moral character. So if you if you are not if you lack Shukr, you lack good moral character. You lack adab. 
So what the Prophet ﷺ was talking about is saying, it's as if saying, shouldn't I have good adab? Shouldn't I be a person who is muadab, a person who, who enjoys that? Uh, uh, and we know that what best describes the character of the Prophet ﷺ throwing his lifetime is precisely this word, adab. He was a person of adab, consistent adab. So, I'll, and I'll close with this because we're, we're in time. So, gratitude then is expressed in meaningful ways. So, gratitude for the eyes, and that's best to think of all your different parts, all the different blessings, and how to, how to be in a state of adab with your Lord as to all the different blessings that Allah gave you. So, gratitude, when it comes to the eyes, for instance, so God gave you the blessings of eyesight. Well, how do you express gratitude? How do you have adab as to your eyes, that blessing that God gave you? Well, and, and uh, uh, this will surprise some, it is not just that you avoid looking at things that are haram, but true adab is, yes, you avoid looking at things that are haram, but beyond that, that if you see what is moral and good, you speak of it to elevate it. But if you see what is not good, evil, or not becoming, that as long as it is not unjust to do so, to actually cover satartu, that in, in that if you see something unbecoming, that you don't go and you uh, um, spread it and speak of it. In fact, in other words, a, a person of true adab um, gives those who do something haram the opportunity to correct their past by not exposing them. True adab is not just that you don't look at things that are haram, but that your eyes become a testament of morality. When the suits see something that deserves to be praised and elevated, you do so. When they see something that is unbecoming, um, you don't enjoy the gossip. You don't enjoy the fadiha, the, the um, what's fadiha? Yeah, the embarrassment. You don't enjoy embarrassing people and talking about it. Um, similarly, gratitude, shukr with the hands, is that you never dare use your hands to take what you're not entitled to. And that you never use your hand to prevent people from receiving their due. So adab with your hands is symbolic in that whenever you employ the power that comes from the, the symbolic power of the hands to take what is not your due or to deny people what is their due, you are lucky Adam, with God, with your hands. As to the Adam of the Batna, it, it's a beautiful expression. And yakuna as and yakuna as falahu as as falahu sabra wa alahu ilma. God, how do I translate this? That your attitude towards your stomach is as if you imagine your stomach a being that deserves to be half full. And half full with what? Half full with two main components. Sabr, patience, and ilm, 
knowledge. Where does this come from? It comes from, from a de medieval image that people with full stomach have thick brains. They can't, they can't absorb knowledge because the more you fill your stomach, the, the more dull your brain becomes. That expression, as fellow sabra wa alahu ilma, comes from that image. That you only feel, always fill your stomach halfway to leave space for energy and study and knowledge that your true hunger you always have hunger for knowledge and if what you care about is consumption you will lose your hunger for knowledge and your attitude towards food is that proper adab towards need, towards hunger, is patience until I'm able to fill my stomach. So in other words, it is not consistent with Adam just because you're hungry, you push people out of your way. Or just because you're hungry, you demand to be fed right away. Or just because you're hungry, you are in a bad mood and in a grouchy mood and start yelling and screaming at people. All the things that are derivative of the adab of the stomach. And Sheikh uh, Muhammad al-Ghazali in his Alum al-Din has a whole chapter on the adab of the stomach that you can read if you're, if you're interested. Um, okay, we're, we're, um, uh, can, you, can you remind me that I stopped here because we still need to talk about the adab of the feet, the adab of the tongue. Uh, the, the adab of the intellect, so, and that will take us another half an hour, and it's already Maghrib, so I'll just stop here, and we'll continue with this, inshallah. No, thank you so much, because it's so fascinating. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, how many people are even aware that this whole discussion, you know, even just like the adab of the stomach, is this is so, um, so nuanced and so deep and beautiful. Um, thank you so much. I mean, there's... Um, it's hard to really express, you know, proper gratitude because this learning is is so new. I think to to so many people, and I think it's when you learn like how much um, how much depth and nuance and thought has gone into to how to elevate and build this relationship. You know, especially now in our time when we have so many people that write to us about um, crises of faith and doubt, and you know, just not really feeling that there's very much to be appreciated in the Islamic tradition. When you get even just a, a flavor of this, you realize how much is in our tradition that's so beautiful and elevating and, and can change everything. So these sessions are, are really priceless. Thank you so much. Um, I, I hope that everyone uh, has a wonderful final few days of Ramadan. And um, you know, I really look forward to um, next week and continuing this journey. And um, thank you so much for joining us. So, um, and join us for Tarawiya tonight. We are still live streaming Tarawiya prayers. Um, and what else? Save the date, October 11th and 12th for the Sui annual conference. Um, and yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you soon, inshallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.